Welcome, Gabor. Thank you so much for visiting the Seekers Forum. Nice to be with you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. You've said that the difference between passion and addiction is that between a divine spark and a flame that incinerates. I yeah. love that. Can you say, how do you define passion and what is the value of passion in a human life? Well, passion is a, really is a flame that burns within you without consuming you. In fact, it enhances you. So I liken it to the burning bush, you know, in the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, or which burns, but it doesn't consume the, 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 the bush. And fire, it heats, it illuminates, it guides, um, it uh, enlivens, uh, it uh, inspires, all that. So a passion is anything that has those qualities and it, and it's usually something that's directed, it's not to do with the ego, it doesn't enhance the ego as such. If it may, it may, the ego may not even like it, you know. Um, so it's, it's beyond the narrow self. Hmm. So, so there's, there's no such, so there's no such thing as a personal passion, a purely personal passion? Well, give me an example. Well, for example, uh, let's say I have a passion for, uh, for writing. Yeah, but that's creativity. That you have a passion for creating. You have a passion for, you, you know, no. Even or, or or even if it's even if you do, usually like you I we write for others. I mean we don't we don't purely write for ourselves, you know. Um, so there is a passion to communicate, to teach, to inspire, to invite, to engage with. You mm. know that that goes beyond the self. Mm. And yet, honestly, when I began writing, I did it for myself, and it wasn't really to communicate with someone else. Okay, uh, all right, so, and, and fair enough. And you just wrote, and you didn't show it to anybody else. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, for a long time when I was a, when I was a young that's, kid, it, well, it, 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 it was a way of actualizing myself. It, okay, it well, that's really, not the ego. That's not the ego, is it? Because that ego wants to show it to everybody and say how great, what look, what a good writer I am. You know. Oh yeah, I see. I see. I see what you're saying. So you, you know, your passion there is for self-expression and, and, and creativity, which has nothing to do with enhancing the ego, which is all about how we look to others. I see what you're saying. I see. So it's not about ego. Isn't just selfish. Ego or ego is all about other people. It's not just about. It's not. Uh, well, the ego is about anything. enhancing oneself from right. the from the outside. Right. I see what you're saying. So why does passion get such a bad rep? For, I, I speak to people, particularly in the spiritual world, and they say passion is all about pain. Uh, the root of passion, of course, comes from pain. Uh, and, yeah. and, and passion, some people think, is a detriment to awakening, to equanimity, uh, and, and to opening. Yeah. You know, it all depends on how one uses the word, but uh, in the spiritual world, it can be seen as an attachment. So mm -hmm. that you're attached to something, an attachment in the spiritual world, especially the Buddhist spiritual world, is seen as a as a limitation, is seen as a imprisonment. So I don't think passion has to be that way. But if it is, I mean, if it's if you define it that way, then it's a spiritual limitation. But it doesn't need to be. Um, mm -hmm. You can be passionate without being attached to the object of your passion. I don't think that most people believe that's possible. I think that probably is the is the sticking point that people think. Do you do you think that attachment in itself is detrimental spiritually? Well, it's it, no, interesting. Attachment has two meanings, really. Um, one is the psychological meaning, and it's used, you know, attachment theory in in, in the psychological world, in the in the developmental world. I mean, I say the child developmental world. It just means the uh, connection with another human being. It's the uh, gravitational drive to connect with somebody else for the sake of taking care of them or for the sake of being taken care of. So uh, an infant has an attachment drive to the parent. An infant bird has an attachment drive to the parent. Um, <clears throat> and the parent has an attachment drive to take care of the child. Mm -hmm. right. 
you can't say that's good or bad. It simply of is. Course. We don't survive otherwise. Of course. But then that same word, attachment, is used in the, you might say, the Buddhist sense of, 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 a, of a desperate clinging to certain outcomes or certain experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, the irony is that people whose attachments or need, needs were met in the first place will not develop the attachments in the second sense. Because that the attachment in the second sense comes from precisely an emptiness and hunger that arises from your needs not having been met. Mm -hmm. So now you have this emptiness and this hunger and you keep trying to satisfy that from the outside and that has negative consequences on you. Mm -hmm. So the first kind of attachment is simply how human beings are. The second is what happens when those needs are not met and now you have this emptiness and uh, uh, craving, insatiable craving, and now you've got, in the personal sense, addictions, and in the social sense, capitalism. Mm-hmm. Say more about that, about capitalism and the connection between capitalism and the unmet attachment needs of a child. Well, I'm just writing a book. Um, you know, the book I was writing when we met a year and a half ago in Costa Rica. And I was having quite a trouble, a lot of trouble writing it. I was almost desperate enough to call you to get some help with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, it's called The Myth of Normal Trauma, Illness and Health in a Toxic Culture. And one of the points I'm making in it is that this society, by the way, we raise children, stress families, uh, tear communities apart, isolate individuals leads us with parenting situations where children's needs are not met for attachment. So that therefore they're left empty and hungry and seeking stuff from the outside. Then we have a whole economy that's based on meeting those secondary needs, those false needs, because our primary real needs were not met. Now we have these false needs. So whole industries are based on selling us stuff that have no other purpose than to temporarily satiate that need for um, completion. But since they can't do it, doesn't matter how many Lamborghinis you drive. I mean, look at any number of rich people who whose lives betoken uh, misery, mm-hmm. you know. And and because so that, but the whole system is based on this idea: the more you get, the happier you'll be. Um, you're all alone. You're individualistic. Attachments don't really work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to be aggressive um selfish and if you believe sufficiently in that you get to be president of the united states you know? <laughs> so this system is based on uh exciting but not meeting that attachment hunger and then filling it with products and activities that can't possibly satiate therefore become addictive so you can sell more products mm. and more activities mm. so that's the vicious circle that's the vicious circle. And, and so that's, you know, that's capitalism. So now you have a system where like look at COVID where we, you know, we uh, had this um, scare that we're gradually climbing out of due to really remarkable mobilization of resources and, 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 and concern and, and science. But then you have other conditions that kill many more people than COVID. For example, air pollution kills every year more than double the number of people that died of COVID internationally. Mm -hmm. Who's doing anything about that? Mm -hmm. Why not? Because air pollution is profitable. Mm -hmm. COVID threatens the economy. So that's capitalism for you. Whatever is, there's a... Canadian writer, philosopher, John McMurtry, who coined the phrase life capital. Life capital is anything that enhances life. Now in this society, life capital doesn't matter at all. It doesn't count. We're quite willing to sell people products that kill them, make food that makes them unhealthy and kills them, uh, sell them products uh, that that make them addicted, uh, engage them in activities that can't possibly fulfill their needs for the sake of profit. Mm-hmm. And that's capitalism. Mm-hmm. Is, is a healthy or healthful capitalism possible, do you think? Well, I want to see it happen. 
uh, I, have, I have yet to see it happen. Um, traditionally, capitalism, first of all, capitalism is based on slavery. I mean, even the concept of race was, you might say, a capitalist invention. Race wasn't always a concept, you know, it came along when it became necessary to enslave people. And now you have to explain how they were inferior to you, so you could enslave them. So it all comes down to profit and loss. Well, the, 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 slavery was all about, it, it, was, it wasn't, uh, it was an economic enterprise. And, and, the, and the mass murder of indigenous people around the world, I mean, from Canada to the United States to South America to Australia, the, their exploitation, their, 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 their subjection by the British Empire, the French Empire, and now the American Empire. These are all based on, uh, they make millions of people dead mm -hmm. around the world and unhealthy. Now at home, uh, the um, William Blake, the British poet, wrote about the dark satanic mills the factories where people, young children were made to work. Mm. So from the very beginning, this system was based on the most severe exploitation. Now it had a sort of a grace period after the Second World War, where there was more social services, corporations were reined in a little bit and their capacity to extort profits. So there were strong unions, but that was a 30 year period, which was totally torn asunder under neoliberalism, Margaret Thatcher in Britain, Ronald Reagan in the States. Now we're back to extremes of inequality. Uh, if you look at the American population, something like 70% or at least on one medication for, for some chronic condition. Now, is that a, an accident or is that an outcome of the system? So if a healthy capitalism is possible, I wanna see it. <laughs> Nobody has yet to prove it to me. And, and the fundamental assumptions that I referred to before, that by human nature we're aggressive, individualistic, selfish, and cruel, is, is a falsehood. It goes contrary to what human nature is actually all about. So how can you have a system based on a false assumption? result in any healthy outcomes. So if you're asking me, the answer is no. If somebody wants to believe otherwise, let them show how it's possible. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about workaholism, which is so yeah. endemic to what you're, you're talking about. Yeah. How would you distinguish workaholism from healthy <coughs> ambition or passion for work? Yeah, so let's just define an addiction, any kind of addiction. So an addiction is manifested in any behavior that a person finds temporary relief or pleasure, pleasure in and therefore craves, but has negative consequences. And despite that, they can't give it up. So pleasure, craving, relief in the short term, negative outcomes, inability to give it up. That's what an addiction is. Now, if somebody works, but is, you know, the Buddha, the eightfold path, you know, talked about the right work, the light, right livelihood. Mm. So if you, if you, first of all, if your livelihood is right in the sense that it doesn't hurt people and doesn't hurt the world, and you love it because you're passionate about it, and you're not so attached to it that you give up your personal life, your, your social life, your, your intimate relationships, and you don't give up your spiritual growth, then it's just a passion. It's wonderful. More power to you. But if you engage, engage with it in such a way that it incurs negative consequences, such as spiritual suffocation, harm to your relationship with your spouse, partner, child, friends, because you're not available and your mind is always on the work, harm to yourself because you can't tear yourself away and you're taking all these stresses, then it's not, a, then you've got an addiction problem. So that's the difference. And it's a fine line between the two. Yes, it really is. But, but really, uh, that fine line creates two totally different worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You brought up spirituality, I was just going to ask you about 
the role of spirituality in countering this cultural toxicity that you talk so much about, how would you begin to, to talk about how spirituality can, 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 can modulate uh, ambition uh, and, and, and capitalism? I will, but you tell me what you mean by spirituality. I was going to ask you. It's it's like one of these words, like God, you know. How do you define spirituality? Well, it's an awareness of, on some level, and a desire for belonging to an understanding and recognizing something greater than your little self. Um, That's really how I would put it. Uh, Now, I'm not somebody who's had deep spiritual experiences that I could talk about with any articulation, you know, um, uh, nor, nor, nor in truth am I somebody who spends significant time in what would be recognized as spiritual practices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, although I've done a lot of spiritual reading, um, but the problem with spirituality is that it can be as much as an addiction as anything else. And it can be a bypass. I mean, how many, never mind the Catholic Church, which serially and, and, and chronically and <laughs> relentlessly abuses children. I don't mean the church, I mean people high up in the church with the best credentials. Mm-hmm. Or this happens in any denomination, by the way. It happens in the Orthodox Jewish community. It happens in uh, uh, certainly in other Christian denominations. It also happens in the so-called spiritual world. I could offhand name you five well-known, inter- internationally revered spiritual teachers and leaders who've abused their their followers. I mean, very famous names. So spirituality as such doesn't offer you any kind of uh, an out. Um, when I, if by spirituality we mean the practices that are called spiritual. So it has to be combined. In, and in fact, very often it's a bypass. Mm-hmm. So that's why personally I'm far more interested in the emotional work that people do. Hmm. If, if I had to advise somebody, if they had to make a choice, which they don't, but if they did between so-called spiritual work, which is to say pursuing beautiful mind states, meditating and so on, and doing the inner work, I say do the inner work. Hmm. I don't, fortunately, I don't re- fortunately, there's, fortunately, there's no necessary dichotomy. Right, but right. the one without the other, both without the other are inadequate. I would say. Right, right. It seems to me that when you talk about cultural toxicity and you talk about a culture of addiction, it strikes me as fundamentally a spiritual hunger, uh, an emptiness that doesn't come comes from the attachment to the caregiver and all of that, but it also comes from a lack of sense of being a part of a greater whole. And well, look, we can call it spiritual, but that's just the word, isn't it? You know, when you look at what human needs are, <clears throat> most people who study what human needs are, they agree that human needs include a sense of belonging and a sense of meaning and, and a sense of transcendence. Right. We can call that spiritual, but that's part of our nature. When those needs are not met, we suffer. Right, right. Uh, is there a lack of belonging, do you think, in in our culture? Do you think that that's connected to, uh, to this, to the epidemic of addiction? There is an epidemic of loneliness. Mm -hmm. Um, The number of Americans who define themselves as lonely has gone from 20% to 40% in a few decades. Mm -hmm. And um, your former uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has written a book on loneliness. It's been documented and loneliness actually has physiological consequences. Mm. I mean, people who are lonely, they get sick more easily and they die more rapidly of their disease for physiological reasons. Mm. So loneliness is a huge problem. 
but then what do you expect in a society that says you're a separate individual you you just out for yourself at the expense of everybody else so that you know that's a, that's one of the toxicities of the culture the selfishness the isolation the disconnect yeah, they, they, they induce selfishness and they induced isolation mm -hmm. right. and then we call that human nature yeah. yeah it isn't human nature it goes contrary to human nature mm -hmm. if it were human nature we wouldn't have survived as a species exactly yeah right. we wouldn't right. have survived as a species nor would any um any mammalian species survive if that was their reality right i think people use that definition of human nature to justify a lot of bad behavior <laughs> just well, uh, you know as noam chomsky points it out any society needs to have a working theory of human nature and the society and the view of human nature that any society will have will reflect the dominant structures of those societies so 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 the so-called human nature is used to justify the very system that created that view of human nature again it's a it's a beautiful circularity yeah we're back to the and, 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 <laughs> and as somebody pointed out when somebody does something selfless or kind or compassionate nobody says oh that's just human nature <laughs> but, but we say it when people act selfishly or say, oh that's just human nature yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, why is the one human nature and not the other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to ask you a little bit about trauma. I think it's one of those words that's so uh, <coughs> overused. And of course, you, yeah. you are such an expert in it. Does everyone experience trauma? And how does trauma differ from pain? It's a two part question. Well, that's, a, that's an important distinction. So people often, do we, I would say that on the one hand, the word is overused or used too loosely on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's not used nearly often enough. I mean, there's lack of, there's a complete lack of trauma awareness throughout our culture in medicine, uh, as I, I know very well as a physician, in psychiatry, um, in the law, in the educational system, there's an utter lack of trauma awareness. So we're hardly overdoing it. It's a question of using the word appropriately. So you're right, trauma is not pain. Some, sometimes people say, oh, what you said traumatized me. No, it didn't, it just hurt you. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. That movie last night traumatized me. No, it didn't, it just left you with some upset feelings. So trauma and pain and upset are not synonymous. Trauma is a wound, trauma is a chronic wound. In fact, the word trauma comes from a word wound, mm -hmm. a Greek word for wounding or wound. So trauma is a wound that really hurts and you you retain the pain and you retain your defense against the pain without actually being aware of their source mm -hmm. so trauma is also like what happens to a wound where it forms scar tissue like what's the nature of scar tissue it's protective but it's not like real flesh it doesn't grow it can't it has no growth capacity it doesn't feel it has no nerve endings in it and it's not flexible, it's stiff. So when traumatized, we become wounded, we have a lot of pain and we become scarred, we become limited and, and less flexible and, and harder, we don't feel so much. So the outcomes of that trauma, and trauma by the way is not what happens to you. Trauma is not the fact that you went through a tsunami or a genocide or abuse. And those are traumatic for sure but they're not the trauma, the trauma is the wound that you sustained and still carry. You could have gone through those events, and some people do, very few, but they do. And they're not wounded for whatever reason, we can talk about that. But so the trauma is not in what happens to you, it's, it's, it's what happens inside you as a result. And so trauma is this chronic hidden wound that we carry, where we hurt a lot, where we're inflexible, where we don't feel as much because our hearts are shut down and when we have trouble growing that's why growth invites or demands being vulnerable and being open and that's very hard for people to do when they were hurt in their vulnerability and when they were small and what are some of the reasons that 
certain people are traumatized by events that don't traumatize other people? I know this is a general question, but... No, I think there are two very distinct answers to it. One is that some people are just born more sensitive. About 15, 20% of the population are born with genes that make them more sensitive. The sensitive is a very specific meaning again. Sincere, the Latin word to feel. A sensitive person feels more. So let me illustrate that for you. I'm going to guide you through a little experiment here, okay? I want you to tap yourself on the shoulder gently. Did that hurt? Yeah. No, okay. Now imagine the same experience if your shoulder was bare and there was a burn there Mm -hmm. so that your nerve endings were very close to the surface. And now if you did it again, what would you feel? It would feel much more, it would feel painful. It would be excruciating, actually. Mm. Mm. No, the external event didn't change, did it? Mm. But your sensitivity to it made all the difference. Mm. So some people, no, that's not a bad thing. That same sensitivity can make you more creative, more alive, more insightful, more empathetic, more compassionate. Mm. You can make a more leader. But it all depends on how that sensitivity is responded to by the environment. So if you grow up in a hurtful environment, it's going to hurt a lot more. You're going to be a lot more wounded. That's the first point. The second point is then, what's the context? Because you may feel pain as a child, but if there's somebody there to hold you through that pain and to validate your experience and your emotions and to help regulate your undeveloped little mind that doesn't yet know how to move through pain, then you won't be wounded, even though you experience pain. So again, it depends on eight degrees of sensitivity, and then how much empathetic holding did you receive? This is why some people are more wounded than others. If you're less sensitive, you won't be as wounded. And if you're more supported, you won't be as wounded. But um, that's the basic answer. Right. And so when people talk about being re-traumatized, is that a misuse of the, of the word? Or are they just, are, are, are they feeling some pain, but they're not really being re-traumatized? I think most often that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it's certainly possible to, like for example, um, let's say you are traumatized and you go to a spiritual healer And because you're so desperate for help and your gut feelings have been shut down, you don't realize that this person is an exploiter and they're exploiting you. But that's a re-traumatization. That's adding to the original trauma. So that can happen. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, very often when people say I'm re-traumatized, they just mean that I felt that my my original trauma was triggered. It doesn't mean that they were re-traumatized. In fact, most of the time, I would say people use that word. What they really mean is all this pain and all this rage and all this terror arose in me. And I was re-traumatized. No, you weren't. What happened was that something happened to trigger those states in you. And you could actually use that to learn from that. You know, that could be a that, learning experience. That's what I was just about to ask because students say this to me all the time. They'll be writing about something and say, well, I'm, re- I'm be- being re-traumatized by the question. And I think, no, you're not actually. The no, not. old feelings no. are coming up to be looked at. Yeah, it's just what the person is saying is, I'm having these emotions and I don't want to look at them. I don't want to deal with them. Mm-hmm. Which is actually <laughs> furthering their trauma. Right. But, you know, right. but of course, if people haven't had compassionate holding and if they don't feel 100% safe, they do have a hard time experiencing their pain mm-hmm. and they don't want to. So... Mm-hmm. Partly depends on on the context and the question and who's asking the question and in what spirit they're asking are they asking the question. Mm-hmm. And what about healing from trauma? Is it necessary to know what happened in order to heal from trauma? Well, it's impossible in some cases to know what trauma because in some you can you can be already traumatized in the womb. Mm-hmm. I mean, the emotional states of your mother can already have a wounding impact on you. And much of what happens 
it happens even before you have the awareness to form memory threads. So not, not only is it not necessary, it's in some cases not even possible on, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a lot more accessible than most people think they are. I mean, I've yet to talk to anybody, really, where they say, I don't know how I was hurt. I'll say, I'll say to them, okay, give me five minutes of your time. Really, it takes no more than five minutes. You just have to ask the right questions. So on the one hand, it's not, on the one hand, it's not necessary because life every day will show you how you were hurt if you know how to look. You just have to know what to, if you can know how to interpret your experience, life is showing you every day how you were hurt. Um, uh, it's helpful to know, but it's not necessary. And as I said, it's a lot more accessible than most people believe it is. So if someone comes to you and has uh, early sexual abuse, let's say childhood mm -hmm. sexual abuse, and they know something happened, but they don't know what happened. How do they heal from that? I, they, I, they often say to me, well, if I don't know what happened, how can I heal from it? Well, what they're saying is that if I don't consciously know what happened, because inside yes. them, the knowledge is there, you know? Um, well, I would say to them, how do you know that you're hurt? See, that, look, the problem is not the sexual abuse again. I mean, not that it isn't the problem, but not in any way minimizing it. But the problem really is the wound that they're carrying. Now, let's say, let's give it a physical metaphor. Let's say you came to me with a wound on your arm and it was inflicted while you were sleeping. So you don't know how it was inflicted. And if I'm a doctor or a surgeon, would I start, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you until you actually tell me how exactly did you incur this wound? Mm -hmm. You don't need that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, ask the right questions. That person who doesn't think they know, they know a lot more than they think they do. But they may have shut down around the, uh, around the pain. Yeah, yeah, but then that's how they defended themselves. They shut down around it. Having said that, you know, I worked off from with psychedelics and you want to know what happened to you, go on a psychedelic journey mm -hmm. or go under hypnosis sometimes. Are you, so, are you, a, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I, I, no, I'm only saying that a, it's not totally necessary to know the details. And secondly, there might be a way of accessing it anyway, if you really want to know. And does changing the story, creating a story or changing the story you're living with help to heal trauma? Well, uh, I'm just, uh, what I'm looking for is, typically I can't find what I'm looking for, but here it is. I'm just looking, I'm just working on chapter 22 of my new book, okay? Yeah. And um I'm quoting Dan Siegel, who's a physician and psychiatrist, and he says, and, and this chapter is actually in the possibility of healing. Um, uh, and Dan Siegel says, people can change their lives by freeing themselves from narratives that are literally making them sick. So it's not what happened that makes us sick, it's the story that we tell ourselves as a result of what happened that's making us sick. We can just only change the narrative. Now, I, I can't change the fact that as a Jewish infant, I almost died in the genocide and that my grandparents did. I can't change that fact. That's, that happened. Nothing I can do about it. But I can change what it makes, what I made it mean. And I made it mean a lot of things that were limiting and, and, and constricting. I can change that. So I can't change the narrative of what history actually perpetrated or continues today to perpetrate. Look at Gaza and, and the death of the children there. Um, we can change that, but we can truly change what, it, what we make it mean. Do you, uh, what do you mean by compulsive positive thinking? Compulsive positive thinking? Oh, um, <clears throat> 
some people insist that they only look on the positive side of things. Mm -hmm. And um, well, Michael J. Fox, the actor, he's got Parkinson's disease. Now, I've, he's wrote this biography. The title was Always Looking It Up, Always Looking Up the Memoirs of an Incurable Optimist. Now, you're a writer. Just parse that title. Now, as a metaphor, always looking up. What happens to somebody who's always looking up and they're walking along the road and they're always looking up? What happens to them? They, 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 uh, they get in accidents. They, they bump into other people. They, they walk off cliffs. And uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Look at the second part of that title, an incurable optimist. Well, he's got this significant condition. I'm not criticizing the guy. Bless his soul. He's a very sweet man. But Parkinson's, as many of his other chronic conditions, arise out of trauma and suffering, in my view. And I've known people to heal from severe conditions, not just I have known them. Other people have known them, have documented them, have written about them who've healed by looking at exactly the so-called negative, you know, there is the suffering. Mm -hmm. So I think that people are compulsive, positive thinkers. It's good to be optimistic, mm -hmm. to believe in possibility, your own and everybody else's, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not good to be unrealistic. And reality has to take in all aspects of human experience. And the compulsive positive thinkers excludes a huge range of human experience. Mm. It's a form of tyranny, I think. I mean, we, we just had a president in this country who was a compulsive positive thinker, and he used that to justify all kinds of cruelty and selfishness and denial. Well, I wouldn't put him in that camp. Um, it, it's an unconscious tyranny, first of all. But, and secondly, Trump, was he a positive thinker when he talked about uh, immigrants? Was he a positive thinker when he talked about uh, homeless people or, or uh, people of color? Um, was he, a, uh, I mean, in other words, he, he, he was full of negative thinking. He just projected it onto people he didn't like. Mm -hmm. And he's the one, by the way, the so-called positive thinker, let me, uh, huh read you uh, he actually said that i'm not going to look for the quote now but he actually said the world is a horrible place mm -hmm. uh, uh, animals kill for food humans do it for pleasure mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. friends want your house everything that you have and your wife and these are your friends he says what about your enemies that's not a positive thinker that, 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 he that, that, that's a man who's completely stuck in a zero sum ugly view of the world that then he then does so much to recreate in his own image but that's not that's not the usual positive thinker not the usual positive thinker but he worshiped norman vincent peel he was his first his first mentor was his father and then norman vincent peel yeah it's a big bypass of reality is it's a it. big bypass right so that's what I, that's the sort of toxic positivity yeah where, where well, every, but know, again i'm saying that trump there's nothing consistent about Trump. Like the, the one, the one of his right. traits is that his mind is totally unintegrated. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think the guy even lies. Mm. Maybe he's called him a liar. I don't think he lies. I think he believes a liar is somebody who I'm going to speak an untruth, and I know it's untrue. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go in front of the United Nations, and I'm going to say that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, when I know that that's garbage. That's Colin Powell, the American Secretary of State at the time, or, or whoever he was at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a liar. Um, Trump is not a liar. He's far more disturbed than Dangerous, that. Dangerous, right? Delusional. Yeah, he actually he actually believes that he won the election mm -hmm. because his, his little ego can't handle the concept of losing. Because in his family of origin, he was made to suffer at the very thought of losing. And his father 
tormented his kids with this must win um, aggressive mentality. And one of his brothers, Fred, drank himself to death as a result of all this. And Trump's way of dealing with it was to fragment himself. So I don't think he's lying. I think I think he's coming from a place in himself that's at the level of a two-year-old denial of reality. Whatever reality is not pleasant to him, he denies it. And what about attention deficit? I, I, I like what you said. You say that there's an emotional meaning, that attention deficit has an emotional meaning in people's lives. What might an emotional meaning of attention deficit be? In a well, well all, all mental health conditions do. So that rather than biological diseases, mental health conditions are all responsive to life. So let me ask you a question now, Mark. Real life experiment again, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say I were to become abusive towards you now. Mm -hmm. Call your names, yell at you. What would be your options? I could I could listen to it and, and I could end this conversation. Yeah, you could you could you could just leave, right? Yeah. You could also tell me to go to hell. Mm -hmm. You could fight back, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say if but let's say you're feeling really hurt and stressed by what I was saying to you, and leaving or fighting weren't options. Then what would you do? What do you think you'd do? check out? You would check, check out. So it's a so checking out, tuning out is a coping mechanism. And what's the hallmark of ADD? Tuning out, absent-mindedness. It's not an inherited disease, contrary to all this medical nonsense that people put forward. It's not genetic. It's what it is is a response to early stress mm -hmm. when when the brain is programmed to tune out because the stress is too much, and the more sensitive you are, the more the stress is going to be too much for you. And it doesn't, like in my case, you know, I've already told you my history. There's all kinds of reasons why I checked out as an infant. But you don't need Second World War or genocide. You just need parents who are stressed, economically stressed, racially stressed, um, socially stressed, traumatized. They haven't dealt with their trauma yet, uh, fearful. And the child just absorbs all that, can't handle it, checks out. And then that becomes tuned in, uh, programmed into his brain or her brain. Now you've got this so-called disease, not a disease. Mm. It's, it's a condition, all right, it exists, but it's not who the person is and it's not a disease they inherited, it's how they cope with their environment. Problem mm. is with those early coping mechanisms is later on they become sources of problems. Mm -hmm. It's a response to pain. Everything is a response to pain. And more uh, as a physician and, and researcher, when I say researcher, <laughs> reading the research literature, I found that most mental health, all mental health conditions, so-called mental diseases, and most chronic physical health conditions are responses to pain, mm. unresolved pain. Mm. So many people uh, blame ADD on technology, but that's obviously just a symptom, right? <coughs> Well, we've had these problems before we had the technology. Um, technology makes it worse because it's very addictive and it further isolates people. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Like on the one hand, it really allows a lot of information to be available to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it also allows a lot of lies, disinformation and fantasy and uh, and venom also available to a lot of people and it's addictive and and um, interferes with human relationships so but it's, it's not the problem it's a sign of a system that's deeply problematic and it exacerbates the problems that we already have at the same time this conversation wouldn't, wouldn't be possible without technology you know a lot of your listeners say, oh, that'd be a good thing. I don't want to hear this stuff, but th th that's up to them. You know, point is those that want to hear can hear. And uh, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So technology in itself is, is neutral. Mm -hmm. It's how it's used. And in this, used, in this society, it's used in pathological ways, as well as in productive ways. Can, what gives you hope, Gabor? What, what gives you hope? 
you know, um, I don't deal in hope because hope is always about something happening in the future that I wish would happen. So it's a hope really is a absconding from the present. Um, but Noam Chomsky uh, was one of the greatest minds who ever manifested on this earth. Um, he was asked once if he was an optimist or a pessimist, and he said, well, strategically, I'm an optimist, and tactically, I'm a pessimist. <laughs> right. Which means that in the long term, I see the possibilities of human beings. In the short term, I see all kinds of problems. And I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. So I see the possibility of, of healing and transformation, and both on the social and the personal level. I wouldn't be writing this book or other books if I didn't believe so. So I, 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 that possibility is not, however, a future possibility. The possibility is inherent in the present. Right. Just one last question. Can you tell us something about your book? I know it's not coming out until next year, but can you give uh, the audience some sense of what to expect? Well, if I can um, be a bit self-serving first. Please. Um, or informative, uh, whoever wants to interpret it that way. Um, I've written four books already out there, and they address so many of the issues that we've talked about. I'm not, I'm not going to go through the title of them, but anybody who wants to check them out can just go on Amazon or that. Don't go to Jeff Bezos. Go to my website, and uh, and you can check out the books, so you can just find them online. Um, and uh, next week, Mark, uh, I mean, we're recording this on June the second, I think, and. Uh, next week, depending on where you are, this uh, there's a documentary about my work coming out called "The Wisdom of Trauma," and you can Google that. You can go to thewisdomoftrauma.com, and uh, you can sign up to see it. There'll be a week of conversations with uh, people like Dan Siegel, who I quoted, and uh, Stephen Porges, Peter Levine, Esther Perel, a lot of people in the um, in the trauma world in the psychological world, spiritual world as well, psychedelic world will be interviewed that week online. You can watch all that. You have to make a donation. The filmmakers are going to defray their costs. Nobody needs to make a donation and most people don't. That's mm -hmm. up to you. The film is still available to you. So just check out the wisdom of Dhamma, trauma .com. You can see the trailer and you can sign up to see it. So far, a few days ago, about 200,000 people have signed up to see it. I know they're hoping for many more. But that's available now. In terms of my next book, um, can I actually share the cover with you? Do you have time for that? Yes, please. I just have to put on the. Uh, I'll have to just open up the. Uh, Take your time. Cover, this beautiful cover that just arrived yesterday, so I'm rather excited about it. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the cover, and I just have, and now I'm going to uh, screen share. Oh, the host has disabled screen sharing. Can you enable screen sharing? Um, if you know how to do it. I think what I can do is make you a... Co-host? Co yep. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, share. So can you see the cover? Oh, nice. The myth of normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. So... What I'm going to stop the screen sharing now, if I can. It's a great cover. Yeah, I love the cover. It's really dramatic. Uh, well, I don't know how to stop the screen screen sharing. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Okay, stop share. There we go. So what it's about is what we've been talking about. That this is a toxic culture both in the positive sense of the word toxic, positive in the sense that it actively toxifies people through so many of the products and foods and pollutants and, 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 and psychic pollutants. And toxic also is in the sense that it doesn't meet human needs. And you can hurt a people by doing bad things to them or by not giving them what they need. If I didn't give you oxygen when you needed it, you would die. And this society deprives people of some essential needs, some of which we've talked about. So it's a toxic culture. So this book is about how individual 
health is not an isolated biological uh, phenomena. It reflects our relationships from conception onward, a relationship to the ones close to us, our community, and the entire culture. And that when we try to understand illness or trauma as an individual event, we're missing the point, and we're also missing the possibility of healing. Right. So that in a nutshell is what the book is about. So I talk about everything from culture to politics to individual biology to uh, relationships to spiritual life, everything we've talked about because this really this book really encompasses everything i've come to learn and understand i hope it'll I, i'm trusting by the way at this point because i'm always finished revising it and so far i didn't like the original version which i was working on when i met you i was totally caught up in the bushes trying to cover every detail oh. i think i've been able to hone it down now to something that'll be both informative and, uh, and, and, and interesting and, and also, uh, I hope, inspiring. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to read it and I recommend it to anyone who's watching this and you're a big inspiration for me and I just mm -hmm. appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Mark. I'm grateful for your invitation and it's really nice to see you. You too. Thank you, Gabor.